Oh me gosh, ladies, gentlemen, it's Sunday, it's May 29th, it's 2011, and it is almost time to pay rent. And this is Day 9 Daily number 307. Excellent. Now see, I throw out the rent thing, not because I'm talking to you, not because I think it's important for you to know that I need to pay rent. I say that because it's important for me to know. Because the only time I really end up looking at the date on a regular basis is right before I go live. Pretty much the best time possible to notify myself. Ah, yes, now that all banks are closed and I will be taken up with focus on something else for the next hour, let me remind myself of something I have to do. I could, like, write that down, but that's just so archaic. We live in the future, man, where we can, like, set alarms on our phones and when they go off we go, What was that for? Doesn't really matter though. In very, very ultra crazy, exciting news, there is nifty, thrifty things happening in the near future. First and foremost, I get to go to sleep. Yes, I'm still jet lagged for my wonderful trip, for, for my wonderful trip to Turia, where I got to visit my brother uh, and hang out and play Street Fighter Four with him. Although he is very annoying because he just has Blanca uh, doing a little underslide with Blanca underneath all my freaking fireballs. Um, so bedtime is around 4 p.m. currently, so I'm trying to get that back to like 9 p.m. so I can go to bed where big boys go to bed. Uh, but as my sleep schedule is adjusting itself for the remainder of the week, I wanted to let you know that <gasps> I'll be at MLG on Thursday through Monday. That's right, Major League Gaming Columbus is going to be coming up this weekend where I'll be there casting with DJ Wheat, it me, JP, aka JP's McDaniels, and as well as my brother and Artosis. We'll be out there, so it'll be a giant casting mega archon. Uh, just a little. There's just gonna be a lot of us, okay? So that's nifty, thrifty, fantastic, and exciting news. Uh, a little bit of a special fun day Monday tomorrow. Many of you have been going, "What's the fun day Monday topic?" It is not really a topic for you to submit. We are going to be checking out a free for all that happened uh, between the subscribers. That's right. I I Net was uh, wonderful enough to. Put up a little bit of a prize pool, and then 16 lucky subscribers who applied and were invited got to duke it out free-for-all style. We'll be casting those games, because keep in mind, free-for-alls are not games based around skill and chivalry. It's around just sort of being the quietest that you can be. And then backstabbing everyone at the very last moment. There's a lot of begging involved in free-for-alls, because there can only be one. So without any further ado, let us jump into today's daily. It's going to be a little Idra vs. White Raw from Stars War. And because the creators of that tournament are assholes, they named their tournament Stars War. Do you know how hard it is not to say Star Wars? After years of your parents saying it, and you saying it, and people discussing it, and reading awful fanfic about it, and then to say Stars War? It's brutal, man, but they did play a Stars War match. Idra and White Raw, perhaps two of the most popular players out there. Uh, I actually got the wonderful chance to sit in on Idra vs. Select that was played in the um, Tactic 3D Pro-Am, I think it was. And uh, Idra's play was just so pretty. I just thought, mm, why not pair him against the prettiest pro gamer of all time, White Raw. So that's what we're going to be examining today. So, the structure of this daily is going to be that we're going to watch through the game, kind of do a regular analysis. It's not an extraordinarily long game. And then I want to go back and take an in-depth look at someone's point of view. Because there's a very, very um, weird thing to note that will always happen to you when you rewatch one of your own replays. Is that you'll kind of have this interesting reveal as to, oh wait a minute, that's not the way I felt. You'll play through the game and go, oh god, I could never attack that army, I'm going to run back and defend and build more spine crawlers. And then when you rewatch, you go, I could have defended that. But it's also really, really important to do the reverse, which is where you watch a game and you go, oh yeah, totally, clearly, okay, he's doing that response, that's really obvious. Oh, okay, that guy's building uh, some Colossal, okay, so he's getting a Spire down now so we can get some Corruptors. You know, you have these sort of in intuitions that you just build up over time. But then, if you actually rewatch it from one player's point of view, you might realize, whoa, that player didn't actually see anything when he started to get that Spire. Or, wow, that player actually saw 
that there was a huge force coming in and then decided to make drones. So we're going to see if we can determine any of those fanciness because that is really what makes Idra very, very strong in the opening is what he's able to get away with based upon what he sees. So let's dive right on into things. Let's cry because the sound was disabled. But of course, with a control S or 2, that can be remedied almost instantaneously. We see the map is Taldarim Altar. Or Taldarim Altar, as they say in normal person land. Idris spawning in the bottom right is the festive green. White Ra spawning in the top is the aggressive red. Now there's always... <coughs> excuse me. An important question that we can always ask ourselves at the start of a game. Why is this overlord scouting to the left instead of to the north position? Well... Uh, against a Protoss player, the only thing that can really shoot down this Overlord is going to be your Cybernetics Core units. So if we scout over here to this front, it's going to be quite open, and then we'll always have the chance to retreat here. It's kind of hard to get an Overlord up to a retreat position up here, but if you just send it this way first, it's not a big deal. Think about sending this Overlord up here. Well, it has a very easy hiding spot area up here right it's very very easy to retreat and hide here now for the record if i was against a terran i would send my first overlord here because again it has this nice hiding spot back here where i can do spotting on the expansion where i can hide from the marines that pop out uh, but against Protoss, I would ideally like to have two potential well-placed overlords one here and one here depending on what his start position is, as opposed to sending our first overlord here and then having our second one go left where it will no doubt be shot down by some kind of um, little cybernetics core. And let me just throw out there that what I just did was an example of making a decision between games. Oh, I cannot emphasize that enough. You do not want to be in the middle of a game of StarCraft 2 and think, hmm, I should turn off Skype. And then after that, think to yourself, hmm, what is it that I want to do? Who is it that's messaging me? Ugh, definitely someone I don't want to respond to. Ugh, I'm talking about StarCraft, my favorite thing ever. But yeah, you never want to be in a game trying to make any decision. Um, so of course you want to make those hard decisions outside of the game, but it's always important to take little opportunities and ask yourself questions about your overlord uh, patterns. Uh, ask questions about, you know, how many drones you're transferring, how many workers you're transferring. Maybe you might want to transfer fewer or more, depending on what point in time you're at in the game. So, Idra, we already see some noteworthy happenstancing, where we saw a geyser go down, followed by this hatch, a sort of weird build, cancel build type thing. But um, the pool hatch openings are pretty typical uh, for Zergs nowadays. Uh, we'll go into that in just a minute, or perhaps we'll go into it upon our second watch through. Um, but let's pop over here to Camp White Ra. White Ra is doing, I, I think, everything that is smart that he should be doing. Going for the Forge Gateway opening. <coughs> Trying not to inhale all my saliva, because despite the fact that I'm a very amphibious individual, I still cannot breathe my own saliva. Just trying to keep those out of my lungs as often as possible. Now, one thing that I would like to illustrate that White Rod did that was oh so freaking smart is that always building this second or this gateway before the photon cannon. This is one of these common things that I'm going to tell you, and intuitively it might not make immediate sense, but because we make decisions between games, we're going to go. Oh, that's the right thing to do. Now, this is why it's awesome. If our opponent did do an early expand yeah of course we want to go forge gate cannon we don't really need this cannon fast as we see idra um you know just now um well he could only just now really have a threat of zerglings yep this this drone could potentially yeah they're the, they're the zerglings sorry I had to look a little harder because idra the bastard he's green i can't see him on the minimap as well how tragic so yeah idra um and any zerg who gets a pool reasonably fast um, or excuse me, reasonably slow, obviously you can go Forge, Gate, Cannon. But what if he gets kind of a faster pool? Wouldn't it be smarter to go Forge, then Cannon? Well, no. You can build this gateway, then build the Cannon, and then build another gateway, completing this wall off. And then what happens when this gateway finishes? You cancel this gateway and replace it with a Cybernetics Core. One of the most common tactics of an early expanding Protoss, but figure I may as well. 
it would be a little excessive in pointing that out because people still don't do it and they should do it. So white raw now. Uh, continuing to build some little probies. Continuing to build a couple of probies now. I want to just note something. Please, dear viewers, remind me of this. I wanted to make sure, certain to talk about this at the end of this game, but I just might not remember. Um, so one thing to note, White Ra has both his nexuses rallied to the expansion rather than transferring workers. A very reasonable question is, is it smarter to transfer all your workers to the expansion, or is it smarter not to? Let's answer that at the end of the daily as another example of making a decision between games. A lot of times you'll find that you'll put a lot of thought into some set of decisions. You'll find the answer, and the answer is very, very easy. The answer is like, oh, I guess I do this. You know, one of those, should I get plus one armor? Should I get plus one attack? And then you find out the answer is, I should get plus one armor. And then you just always do that, and there you go. Done. Very, very straightforward. Now, um, at this point in time, I want to note a, one small thing that we're going to watch through when we do the Idra re-examine re, re through, is that Idra could have vomited Larva instead of adding this creep tumor, but definitely we see him favoring that almost always. Very curious to see if this is going to be the optimal so we see White Ra going for his usual Zealot Stalkerage. We see the uh, Warp Gate popping down for Dr. Duckload. Nothing is too out of the ordinary here. This is kind of an early third geyser, though. Uh, it's always useful to put units into your third geyser if you end up using them. Oh, but that's fine. Idra also taking his third base very, very early. And this is one of those ultra common responses for a zerg player who sees a protoss who's early expanded to just expand a whole lot himself likewise for any protoss who sees a zerg delay getting zergling speed at all doing any kind of early aggression is smart any kind of early aggression at all the drones in the main the drones getting pain brung but yeah usual sort of pushing action now um, I just want to briefly talk about these two units, this friendly zealot, this friendly stalker. I want you to note what I did there. I stated the principle of this attack, that this zergling speed is not done. There is no risk of my zealot and stalker getting surrounded by zerglings. I can pretty much always retreat safely. The only way I'm under threat is if for some reason he ends up with a whole bunch of slow zerglings. But either way, if he makes like 16 slow zerglings, I'm still happy he made that instead of 8 drones. So that's awesome. We love that. I do not want you to go into build order mode where you're like, well, is my build order, I just get a zealot and I just get a stalker and a zealot and I just sort of, that's just what I do. You can all, you always want to at least give some other reason than, yeah, it's just my build, it's just what I do. So, uh, what we're now seeing is one of the reasons why players will always enjoy getting a fast Stargate against a Zerg player. See this third, this fresh, juicy third that just finished up? You see how there's no creep right here? Oh yeah. We love getting a fast Stargate when, we are, when we're playing Protoss. Um, just because if we could avoid Ray fast enough, this is about that magical time when Zerg ends up taking his third. What if Zerg hasn't taken his third? Well, then you can prevent him from taking it with the Void Ray. And what if he's gotten it as fast as frickin' possible? Well, he's still gonna have problems because there's no creep adjoined. So again, we're we're not just saying, yeah, I get the Void Ray because it's part of the build. There's a very, very important reason why. Yeah, we kill Overlords, and yeah, killing Overlords is good, but really, pressure on the third is the awesomeness. So, uh, I, I would like to note that up till this point in the game, I haven't noted that this is uh, unusual, so let me do that. What the f- White Rock going for a double Stargate build on Taldarim, you baller. Oh, yeah, going for the double Stargate. Thank you, White Raw, for your entertainment value. He's better than going to the movies. So we do indeed see that there is this fancy layer up. We're seeing that there is the plus one up. We're seeing that there is the spore crawlers up. Mm, excuse me. Thanks to Idra's very cleverly placed Overlord, he does see that there is at least one Stargate up, so we're seeing five queens actually get produced right at the outset. So Dr. Duckload, see, putting pressure on this third base. Idra is, of course, you can see, well prepared for one, one Void Ray to come on in. Um, 
had a, a little bit of um, extra preparations for the second one, but the fact that there were two queens there made him perfectly, superly well prepared. And then we see the sprint to join everything together with Creep. And this is one of those very, very um, unintuitive moments in the game. One of those extremely unintuitive moments. Notice, we have a Hydralisk Den down. We've seen that there are a lot of units coming out of Stargates. At this point in the game, you're actually going to be thinking to yourself that my opponent has a second Stargate. Um, especially when you see those two Void Rays coming at that, at that early time. But when, when you're at that point, you would think intuitively, how do I deal with the air, right? How do I exploit this? Um... And, or excuse me, how do I deal with the air in a direct fashion? Let's actually get away from the how do we exploit this question. Um, when we see the air, it's so intuitive to say, oh, I'm going to build hydras to try to kill that off. Or, hmm, can I end up getting a spire in time to build corruptors? Maybe I need to get some infestors to lock those down. There's all the ways with dealing with it directly. But there is that amazingly, gloriously comical photo that popped up on Reddit where it was Mondragon Zerg vs. Protoss build. And it was like, counter to everything, Roach. And then the counter to the Phoenix was a hatchery. Because you can't lift a hatch. Um... That is actually very, very, I mean, it's funny, but it's actually quite clever. Because in a sense, when we see this amount of air, we can always ask ourselves, well, what is this air really, really bad at? As opposed to thinking, what can we kill? It's what does this prevent my opponent from really being able to do very well? Um, and the roaches sort of sidestep everything. Sure, you can go ahead and make nothing but void rays, but if I'm going mass roach and I've forced you to make a bunch of void rays, you're very, very predictable now as Protoss. What if um, I made a whole bunch of roaches and you continue to make phoenixes? Well, I can just expand like crazy. We're going to see the way that these roaches can begin to just sidestep around everything. Um, that is one of this is going to be an example of one of the most important concepts in all of RTS gaming period, which is the notion of sidestepping. What is my opponent weak at, and what is he strong at? And let me just step out of the way of what he's strong at. Tanks, really, 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 really good units if you attack him. So if he's going for mass tanks, you can expand a lot. You can do lots of counterattacks and drop a lot. It is freaking awesome just to bounce around it entirely. So. From the Protoss end of things, this is an intuitive next step. I am forcing you down some alleyways. I am forcing you away from things like masses of zerglings and masses of roaches. I'm forcing you away from being aggressive and likely forcing you to build lots of hydralisks. Therefore, I will get my Colossus up very, very quickly and I'll be very, very good against you. White Ra, obviously, uh, taking the opportunity to do a little bit of expanding action himself. Has successfully picked off a queen. Excelente. We are seeing yet more Hydras get produced right now. Again, dealing with it in a seemingly very, very direct fashion. But I haven't quite mentioned too much about this ventral sack, this drop play. The important thing to note is that it was in response to seeing this air, right? Again, I want to just keep saying that word over and over and over again. Sidestepping. And now we're seeing a lot of larvae get added to all these hatches. And when they pop off, keep in mind what magic would happen and what you would likely want to do in that situation. And what would seem intuitive. Imagine yourself in the pre-beta days and you are seeing tons and tons and oodles and oodles of air units and maybe you're at a LAN party and you leaned over to your opponent's computer and even saw these masses of void rays getting produced and what you would intuitively end up doing. We see another expand going down for Idra. See, White Raw's play I actually think is, uh, I mean, as unorthodox as it might seem and as totally awesome as it is, this sort of play makes a lot of sense and it's pretty easy to execute. You know, you make a bunch of colossi, bam, <laughs> yeah. Make a bunch of air, make a bunch of colossi, get, a, get some ground in there at some point. But we're seeing this slow advancement forward. And now this is a play that's going to seem very, very funky to a lot of people. The fact that, oh yeah, if he's going mass air, yeah, I'll just, I'll drop him. 
I'll just go for a very, very quick, cool drop play. I mean, you would you would think something like, but he should have a bunch of phoenixes and void rays, and shouldn't he just kill my overlords? Shouldn't he just annihilate all that stuff? Well, this is one of the interesting points also in gameplay where everything sounds fine on paper, and you just kind of have to test it out. From the Zerg's point of view, um, now we can start to really see Idra's um, playstyle come into the mix, right? I'm going to talk about that, you know, working on paper in just a moment. We're actually just going to see the beginnings of a drop. Look at this, very clever, leading with a couple of roaches. Oops, target firing the robo. And suddenly we realize, yeah, wow, that guy really does not have that much stuff. And oh my god, look at that drop play popping right on in there. And they're just doing all sorts of fantastic damage. And oh yes, multiple places. Oh, yeah, all right, cool. Now I'm starting to have a very clear sense of why this is such a strong play. Now let's let's back up a moment. Let's say that we haven't engaged in this uh, game quite yet, right? Let's say we're 10 minutes before our match, right? And we're either White Rot or Idra, and we're talking with one of our buddies about what our strategy is. If I'm opening up with my two Stargate on paper, what I say is, okay, so I put pressure on him with Void Rays and Phoenixes. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to take my expansion, I'm going to take me to Colossus, because you know he's going to build some Hydras, because he has to, to deal with all this air. And then I'm going to get a huge Death Ball army. And your friend says, well, what if he drops? Well, it's okay, I have so many air units and I have total map control that he's kind of on the defensive, and I can just snipe off a lot of those overlords anyways. Now, uh, from the Zerg point of view, though, we'd say something like, okay, well, if he ends up going for a whole bunch of air, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a huge um, counterattack drop really early. In particular, I'm going to split my units up. So I have a couple of units dropping in the main and a couple of units dropping at an expansion. Because if he's going for a big air army, he won't be good at dealing with a bunch of split up units. And in particular, I'm going to be building a lot of roaches because phoenixes are not very good against roaches. Uh, you have to waste a lot of lifts picking up a lot of the roaches. Phoenixes are much better against Hydras just because Hydras are more expensive units. So one lift has more value with that Graviton Beam. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to do this drop. I'm not really going to make that many Hydras. I'm going to make just enough to help me stay alive, but mainly all roaches because he really cannot deal with a lot of roaches in a lot of places early on. See how both of those sound fine on paper? They both sound okay. The two stargating player seems to have the defense. The Zerg dropping player seems to have that offensive opportunity. This is why testing is so important. I definitely think it is ultra, ultra critical to do tons of theory crafting, right? But you have to go into games knowing what you want to test. I don't necessarily mean that you need a practice buddy for every situation. You hear me a lot refer to how important it is to have that practice buddy edge. Um, but I want to... Uh-oh, 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 what is my computer doing? All right, cool. Yeah, I thought it was going to crash, but then it told me it wasn't. Yeah. Uh, what I mean about the, you know, uh, know what you're going to test, when you're going into a game on the ladder, just say something like, if I see my opponent go for a lot of Stargates, I'm going to try to get a really fast drop with a lot of Roaches. And just sort of have that test in your mind. Just as you might have something like, if he goes for a Mass Bling Stalker play, I'm going to try to not get Infestors against that. I'm going to try to do this. And you have these two little tests in mind that you're going to do. Again, you don't want to have any of this intuition like, oh, I'm just going to figure it out on the fly. Because it might seem counterintuitive to do something like, you know, have a big drop. But if you're a player like Idra, you know, who who does, um, you know, work through a lot of styles with a lot of depth, you, you want to have those same sorts of testing questions in the air. You want to have those little testing questions super ultra available. Because you know what the best part about having a silly test going? Is you can do it completely naively with no doubt whatsoever. You can easily say something like, I wonder if a big counter drop will be good. I guess that's just what I'm going to try to do next game. And then you do it and as you're getting absolutely mauled, you're just like, whoa, I know the answer to my question. Holy, oh man, that's easy now. Uh, but again, you really do not want to do... Um, 
you don't want to do too much of this intuiting or self-doubting. Feel free to have a couple of experiments planned in your play. And honestly, let's pretend that this is like the third time you've ever done this sort of drop press as Idra. Like you don't know if it's necessarily good or not. What's a great way to approach this situation? Um, you can easily say to yourself, this is the experiment I'm going to do in this drop situation. But all the rest of the time I'm going to play completely, totally straight up. I'm gonna play. I'm gonna have this little experiment in my play, and that's something different that I'm gonna do. You know, it's kind of funny. Um, it's very tempting to want to do something crazy in your gameplay if you're feeling, you know, like you're 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 having that redundancy going on. It's very easy to say, "Oh God, I two racks every single game. This game, I'm gonna try to nuke rush him." And in a sense, you're you're. It's less experimenting and testing and more just like messing around uh what i would encourage you more to do is to rely on whatever solid foundation you have like i two racks every single game but um if i see him doing blank i'm gonna respond by going mass marine marauder and not getting any tanks something like that or if i see him doing blank i'm gonna try to drop a ghost in there or two make it a response that you're experimenting that you're testing out instead of just a I guess I'm doing something stupid this game because I want to do something stupid and win and feel superior you can just do cool things and be superior and be players like Dr. Duckload so we're seeing Dr. Duckload slowly begin to stabilize it's not super stable as you will no doubt uh, clearly see from the current game state. And now we're ending up seeing uh, Corruptors get made. We see these upgrades coming down in Idra Town. We see this fourth base coming up. Is he getting a fifth? You know it. And by the way, this is the awesome fifth base placement. This is... I, I just... I have no better word for it than correct because it's very easy to say something like, yeah, maybe I'll expand here to another main or, you know, to, to just sort of pop down at uh, something haphazardly. The most common one I see is someone who just, you know, takes a main as, as another one. But I'd like to note that roaches and hydras are slow. So this is, you want closer, easier to defend expansions if you have a slow army. Exact same reason why White Ra is taking this this closest by expansion because it's very easy for his ultra slow mobile army to defend it and if it were protoss versus protoss and white raw was here it's actually reasonable to take this as your second base if you're going for blink stalkers again that mobility is very very convenient for defending those sorts of things so here we see Idra continuing to try to apply pressure via drops, and this is one of the moments in time when it's very easy to say to yourself as, you know, let's say your Idra to be like, oh god, never want to try that drop play again. He just has Void Rays in a good position, and god, I end up losing immediately. Um, still do not want to fall into that trap, as we've seen it be very, very effective. Again, when we go through on the Idra playthrough one more time, we're going to look at why. But for the most part, let's talk about the recovery process for White Raw. White Raw's obviously been battered down quite badly. What's the best way to play out? Just to defend and to go for a death ball play. That's the obviously easiest thing to do ever. Just to go for the simple death ball. And Idra is doing something that is also quite clever. Uh, it's, it's actually quite difficult to execute um, properly uh, because you have to do it at the right time. It would seem weird to do a lot of poking and prodding with these three bases so close together, but we see Idra just doing little tactics, popping on here, doing a little damage, keeping his Colossus count down. Uh, you know, this can even open up opportunities for another little drop. We see a sneaky little Overlord here that just managed to do a little business, causing all the probes to have epilepsy. And yet now we're seeing Idra just sort of continue along with this plan. Suddenly... The obvious unit is here. The Corruptor, that thing that will deal with the air in that direct way, is now available. Idra didn't have that before, but now that he's in a very good position, that he had the opportunity to build that sort of stuff up, now he can just sort of bounce around and continue to have himself have some nice, happy little aggression. A lot of corrupts going on. White Rock going to try to morph in some more stuff. 
in the midst of an attack like this, never mind just, I never ever mind just like two Hydras being dropped there. But at this point, it's very, very easy to do something wrong. In fact, someone might ask, why didn't Idra go for a drop like there? Even though that can't ever really be bad to drop two Hydras there. There comes a point where you need to stop poking and prodding. Judge that you can just make a big attack and win. And that's what Idra's doing. He's judging the situation and saying, yeah, this is about the time when I can really begin to bust in there and mess him up with a, with a huge final drop. So all these uh, attempts by Idra are kill moves. Whereas I would argue that that early, early attempt was not necessarily a kill move, but these very much so are big Hydra numbers. Yeah, look at that. Interestingly, now the Hydras are coming in, now that the air is dead. Roaches were, were being made when the air was nice and prevalent. So, what have we done up to this point in, in uh, our little daily 307? So what we've done is we've looked at, um, we've just kind of went through the game and kind of talked through it. It almost felt like a regular shoutcast at an event. We didn't really do too much pausing at too many moments. But we noted some relatively um, big picture sort of ideas from both players' point of view. We looked at White Ra's play. Very clear set of timings. Clear zealot stalker pressure at the start because we want to save gas for our Void Rays, and we can put pressure because we see no link speed. Very clear why getting those fast air units is good, because the third generally doesn't have creep adjoining it, so you can apply pressure. We immediately saw why the expansion was going down. Zerk was distracted. We saw why the Colossus were going up, because he should be making uh, those Hydras, or just some sort of ground unit in general, because we rule the skies with our air. So, I mean, White Rot made great, great, great sense. We talked a little bit about what Idra did, but now what we're going to do is we're going to go into the game, we're going to rewatch from Idra's point of view and really look very, very um, tightly at what Idra is doing this game. Because this is a tactic that, like, especially that drop and this responding that Idras are going to, that Id jet lag is interrupting my ability to speak English. We're going to look at Idra's very, very nice timing. I mean, pretty much always, Idra has good timing. In fact, you know, I, I just want to note that Idra almost consistently says that his late game is his strongest point, that his macro is just his long-term play. I actually don't think that's true. I mean, it's obviously, like, phenomenally good, but the thing that always gets me all excited watching him play is the little, tiny things he does in the early game where you will watch him play against, like, the best Zerg in the world, and both of them are going roaches with upgrades. When they get into the battle, the opponent has 1-0 roaches, and Idra has 1-1 roaches. And they both have the same amount of drones, and they both have the same amount of roaches, and you're wondering, how on earth did Idra end up squeezing in another Evo Chamber in an upgrade? And the answer is that he did, and that's what we want to look for, is we want to do it too. So in particular, those timings, especially what Idra does in uh, relation to what he scouts, and what units are brought to him. That is uh, another very useful lesson. What units are being brought to me? Oh, my Terran player, he brought me Hellions! At this specific point in the game, well, then I can get a relatively clear read on what his possibilities could be. So now we see E.G. Idra spawning at the bottom right position. Let's go into the E.G. Idra cam. How cool. So, again, we're seeing him send that Overlord Scout in that other direction and I want to talk all about the various vulnerabilities that we want to have on the head as we are playing through the game. There's a lot of fear that you need to translate into timings. You need to not say something like, ooh, I mean, he could be going Phoenixes, I better get some some uh, Spore Crawlers up. Ooh, he could be going for a DT Rush, I guess I better have detection at my front. You want to instead say something like, at time X, that's when I'll see a Phoenix. Didn't see it? Okay, I guess he's going for this then. You want to have these all written down as little timings in your StarCraft II notebook. So we see now Idra moving up here with the Overlord, just throwing down a 15 spawning pool. Kind of a far down the road spawning pool. And we're seeing Idra now send two drones. Notice that these drones are actually being sent a little bit early. Notice that Idra is not quite going to have 300 upon reaching here. So here is another very, very clever response that Idra does. 
In general, Idra would want to throw down a hatch. If he can't, he's just going to throw down gas and start getting some gas early. Fortunately, there was absolutely no... Um, there was no attempt to block the hatch, so Idra actually is going to do that uh, hatch of the expansion a little early. Now, you do lose something like, I don't know, 25% of 25 minerals. I don't even want to calculate that. What is that? It's just like 6.25 minerals. Um, it's not a big deal to cancel a Vespian Geyser. And, of course, losing a little bit of mining time. You've basically lost 10, 15 minerals upon that extractor cancel, but you definitely uh, get a nice little teensy bit of a, a, of a booster with that help. So there's the Overlord popping out, building that uh, after we built our hatch. We notice that we're getting um, our extractor right away after we end up getting our queen. We're only getting one Zergling. Notice that Idra has interestingly not scouted. Weirdly enough, Idra is only just now scouting. Now that's one of those moments where... I think many, many fine folk out there would kind of have this, well, why? Why does he not scout early? And some, even more people are out there probably going like, oh, well, I guess he just scouts at 20 food. But there's a couple important things to note about the scouting that's gone on. We've already sent an overlord to this left spot. And Mr. Probe, who should be sneaking himself over here. Yeah, there's Mr. Probe. Mr. Probe reached our base pretty early. When the probe reached our base, where was our opponent not at? He was not at this top left area. Because timing-wise, unless he scouted cross map, timing-wise, there's no way that he would have reached our base that early. So he's either in top right or bottom left. We know he's not in bottom left. So in other words, this guy sinks right on up with um he sinks right on up with this overlord this drone sinks up with this overlord there we go so he's going to end up scouting it at around about the same time and also notice four minutes and four seconds there should be a timing that should stick out in your brain four minutes and four seconds um if your opponent went gateway and then cybernetics core like just the most normal one base, two gas in the world, then his zealot will pop out at around 3 minutes and 45 seconds, and his stalker slash sentry will pop out at around 415, 420. So in other words, this drone can reach his base, and then you can actually right-click through the zealot. Um, humorously enough, I know that used to be true. I know you used to be able to do that. Um, I feel like you still can. I'm, I can't believe I don't actually know that. Uh, but I mean, I actually don't like running my drone in there to, to go on a suicide mission or to even steal gas. I personally prefer to do something very nice and gentle, like just check what's up there. Uh, but the important thing though, is that you can get to the front and get a definitive sense of what's going on without risk of having this drone be shot down. Whoopsie daisies, accidentally ran over my Chipotle bag. Go over there, little Chipotle bag, stay balanced. So we are seeing that, you know, this drone is actually arriving at a, an amazing time. It's before the photon cannon is done. It's before a stalker would have been done if he was doing some kind of very, very fast um, gas play. Some one base fast gas play. So this is actually a very, very smartly timed drone. And just two Zerglings, more Zerglings would no doubt be popping out. I suppose two gate can be a potential issue, um, but I'm I'm just gonna not think about that anymore because the daily's been going on for a whilst. And we must continue our analysis. Good little zergling placement here, and we're seeing that again. This creep tumor is going down. Now to note, I asked the question earlier on: Why get this creep tumor instead of going straight for the larva vomit? A lot of people say, because you have to join your two bases together with Creep. But we even see players like Nesty not doing that. The big reason that I would foresee is that Idra's getting this gas quite quickly and is going to be going for this Zergling speed. So we're seeing, look at this, we already have a good amount of larva that we can't quite spend. We're taking a third very, very early. So, in a sense... 
yeah, we could be trying to vomit as much larva as we possibly could. But we're just not quite going to have enough money to do that. We're just not quite going to be able to... Where are those things? There we are. We're not going to quite be able to support that. So, in other words, completely ignoring any ability to attack or defend or what he's doing, you always have to ask all your decisions in the context of money. Always, always, always. Always ask yourself the decision within the context of money. Um, you know, you want to get cloaked banshees? Well, you're going to have to get that second gas like around 16, 17, 18. You just won't quite have enough gas, regardless of what else he's doing. You're kind of forced along those lines. In it, Here, you want to get a third base up and you want to get speed kind of fast? Well, then you just can't quite support that many larva vomits. Um, so you can get this creep tumor. It's very easy to fall into the trap of going, oh yeah, the creep tumor is just good because you want to join these things together. Well, hey, now we've translated this concept of creep tumors back to money. So that means that at any point in time, in any game, you can say to yourself, hey, I seem to not be able to build enough larva. Maybe I'll just throw down a second creep tumor. So we see Idra continuing to scout around in, in little circles. Nothing but drones, a queen coming out. A Roach Warren coming out, I always call this like the emergency backup Roach Warren. Idra's actually lost a couple of Zerglings, but he's remade two to pick off the probe in his main. Note this kill count on this Zergling right here. Um, and Idra is going to continue to poke and prod the front, aggressively so. He has his other Overlord. Remember this first Overlord that we said, hey, Mr. Overlord's going to check this area, so that way he can always hide up here if Protoss is here. Well, of course, this Overlord's now hooking up here to check for where the fourth and where the third base could be at. But Mr. Second Overlord, Mr. Overlord, can now easily peer in here in the same way these Zerglings are peering at the front. Very, very essential move. So now we do see a smidge more Zerglings are being produced. Just a touch more. Wait a minute, there's a Zealot over there. Idra, of course, notices it in an instant. Tracks them down, takes them out. So now we have our uh, evolution chambers going down. We have our layer popping up. These are all basic essentials. Our creep tumor has not quite managed to make its way all the way far forward. But we notice, hey, Idra built another creep tumor. Well, it was with the third queen that was popping out. But again, relating that back to economy. Can't quite necessarily support all that. So we're noticing, ooh, this is actually quite, quite kick-ass. See this evolution chamber going down? Lines right up with the timing of the Overlord. Build the evolution chamber, send in the Overlord. If we see air, wow, I mean, look at this. This is the exact time when air would be about popping out. And that's when he ends up sending this in. So... Idra waits until the last possible second to be guaranteed to see air. Again, if his opponent is going air. He waits the last second to be able to walk in there. Lines it up with this Evo chamber. If Idra sees air, well, yeah, he's going to just build extra spore colonies in a very obvious attempt to help himself stay alive. And if there's no air going on there, this is an excellent time to begin getting an upgrade. Yeah, look, there's the upgrade going down anyways. I guarantee you Idra would be getting that upgrade if he saw all these duders or not. Queen's coming down. Very obvious response. Hydral is again going down. Very obvious response. No other upgrades really seem to be getting constructed right now. I would note that this, um, in terms of timing, we had one gas early on. And then once we decided we were going to go layer, we just had these two gas geysers running up until when the layer started. This geyser has not actually been alive for very long. So the fourth one is actually quite late, after our third has more than enough creep sort of surrounding it. Creep continuing to be spread aggressively to the right. Voiders end up popping, uh, popping in. Oh my gosh, drama, drama, drama. No big deal. We're first going to see Idra get roaches, roach speed, and that range upgrade. These seem to be the primary goals of Idra at the start of the game. Or at the start of seeing this harass. Look, more roaches being out. There were five before. Two more got added over time. There's the last two that were being produced. Still have not really done too much in terms of building the actual hydras. See, and there's the drop. There's the speed going down. 
Uh, a little bit of a slip up in the macro department. We'd like to see some more drones getting produced. Drones and queens are always a very reasonable line to go along. Because we want drones to build our economy and we want the queens, no doubt, to help us stay alive. And we're seeing some hydralis get made. And one may ask the question, Okay, Day9, you said all this fancy stuff about, um about not building hydras, that Mondragon didn't build any hydras at all. But what I want to note here is that Idra's trying to build as few hydras as possible, and we see almost no hydras get produced during this phase of gigantic aggression from White Ra. Looks like White Ra getting himself a little bit overeager, losing some stuff. And as we end up stepping forward in time, we see, wow, you know, I'm actually starting to get Another one of the reasons why we're not really getting that many Hydras. Because we're not getting these Gas Geysers very early. I think Idra could have snuck them in a little bit earlier. But I mean, note that the speed cost a good amount of gas. This drop costs a ton of gas. Drop in speed is, is a hefty investment in the gas department. You really can't actually afford to get that many Hydralis. It just interrupts the rest of what you're doing by so so much. There's the range going down, always an essential upgrade to get and to have, but for the most part, just made a couple of roaches while that was going on, just made a couple of hydras, and interestingly, this is a moment where generally zergs would want to continue to macro. See, there's 62 drones there. You'll generally see zergs stop around 75 or so, or if you're moon, you stop at like 100. But, um, this is a moment of aggression in this play style. We see all the other units actually poking and prodding around the map. This is actually, I think, my favorite part of the whole game. Oh, yeah. Um, StarCraft II players are not Brood War players. Brood War players expanded like crazy. Brood War players went nuts with their extra bases. Not StarCraft II players. StarCraft II players are used to three bases, and that's it. So there's actually a real big trend on ladders now to just... The high bases, and just a sort of, like, this is my build where I expand and no one scouts it, you know? But, like, Idra, the seemingly unusual time where there really shouldn't be another expansion, he's just making sure that there is definitely not another one. Now, at this moment in the gameplay, it's very easy to sort of tell yourself he has more than he does, but let's just go to the unit counting station. Look at this. Two Zealots, one Immortal, three Void Rays, a Stalker, a Phoenix. Wow, actually, yeah, that's... He ain't got nothing. In other words, whenever you go for this sort of big, beefy-style army with a whole lot of air units aggroing really early on, uh, and especially when you're getting your Colossus up really, really fast, I mean, these Colossi weren't really delayed that much. Um, but it's going to be very, very hard to fight in two places at once. So first, Idra pops over here to the far backside and then drops into the main. Notice how few roaches, or excuse me, how few hydras there are. Just a pinch of hydras in that mix. As few hydras as you can get away with. And then, as you can see, massive damage ends up ensuing. And this is actually going to be a very reasonable time to throw down ourselves a little handy-dandy set of drones. But I would also note that the spire, which I believe is somewhere around here. Yep, there we go. The spire that's going down. Clear response to seeing these two robotics facilities getting thrown down. Because if we see air and two robos, I mean, there's nothing wrong with just default trying to produce as many of those corruptors as possible. And we start to see the real efficiency of this sort of attack. I actually would not even mind having a hand, like three more roaches just getting dropped over here. The more points that you can attack at, at this moment, the better. Um, this isn't always going to be true. We're actually going to wrap up this daily in just a moment, because now we end up seeing the sort of clear kill sequence. Uh, you heard me uh, just a moment ago talk about how, oh yeah, this was generally a good time for Zergs to make drones, but we're seeing Idra make only units. Another way that Idra's strengthening his late game is instead of making drones, right as he's doing this attack, just getting another upgrade. So yeah, obviously favoring the gas, because we seem to be a little bit high on minerals all game long, and getting the Corruptors is definitely going to help out with the whole... Um, or the gas is definitely going to help out with the whole mass Corruptors aspect to it. But it's very easy to become addicted to that, oh my god, a drop here and a drop here worked really well. Suddenly, 
spreading our forces thin might not be the greatest as we're starting to get uh, more and more ability to spread ourselves out just a little bit as White Raw. We can, you know, have two Void Rays here and the rest of our army here and we're in, in somewhat decent shape. So I do not mind at a moment like this throwing down uh, an Infestation Pit going for Broodlords. I really, really, really do not mind that at all because personally, um, I, don't, I don't really think that there's a good way that Protoss can pressure you. You can easily do light roach drops and have a bunch of corruptors, and there's not much that he can really do counter aggressively. And then you can just get your your basic brood lords, um, or you can just sort of go for the kill sequence in this nice little fashion. So we're gonna go ahead and hop into the question front. I'm gonna go to Markio's amazing question grabber. Let me even open my internets to do as such. Do, 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 do. Markio, logging in. What's your username? Day nine, that's my username. Bam. And go. Go. Marky, your question grabber is not working. I'm just going to have to go to the chat. How miserable. Oh my god. Thank you, chat, for reminding me you are, you are too kind. Um, I did want to especially, definitely, indubitably note this little uh, question I asked at the start. Is transferring workers a good thing or a bad thing? Is this a good thing or a bad thing? For any of you who don't know what I'm talking about, there was this moment where we saw... Doo -doo 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 Unpause, replay. Yeah, where there was this moment where a whole bunch of stuff ended up moving out here. Um, yeah, the expand went down. We were asking, well, White Rod did the double rally here. Is that good or bad? Is this good or bad? Should he transfer those workers? And this is actually a really good moment when you can start doing some calculations, right? Like, so, here's actually a discussion I had with one of my mathy buddies. If you can actually sit down and have a clear, rigorous way to describe if something's good or bad you can end up realizing interesting things. Like for instance, let's say that the amount of minerals that you lose from having a worker go from here to here, let's call that X, right? So if we box four workers, if we box these four workers and then send them to mine here, we've lost four X total minerals. So then if I rally this nexus here and rally this nexus here, the most I have lost all game long is 4x. Good. But if I have both of them rallied there, if I have both of them rallied, well, every time a probe pops out, like this probe, okay, when the first probe pops out, then I lose x. And then the next probe pops out, then I lose x again. And then the next probe pops out, then I lose x again. So in a sense, if I transfer all my workers, I have an immediate loss of income. I immediately lose 4x, but that's the most I'll ever lose all game long. All right, well, what if, what if then say like, um, sorry, yeah, what if I'm doing this rally trick? Well, then I'll lose x, so immediately I'm not losing that much, just x, and then 2x, and then 3x, and then 4x, but if I keep it rallied, then I'm losing 5x and 6x, so I almost have a curve on that one with how much money I end up losing. So, you can actually sit down with an, a description like that and realize that sometimes it's better to transfer workers, sometimes it's better to rally workers, just depending on when you're going to re-rally your nexus to your main and your expansion nexus to your expansion. So just throwing that one out. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Let's see here. Um... So, Kappa87 asks, Dear Day9, why didn't White Ross simply continue to go air instead of uh, transition to the Robos? Um, I'm a little... I, I, I don't have a, a very clear answer for that. I mean, I think that there are things that he could have done that, again, I would leave to the realm of testing. I think the best reasoning why is that uh, White Ra really loves Colossus Void Ray mixes. He has been doing Colossus Void Ray Stalker in uh, PvZ for a very, very, very long time. So it looks like he just did an opening that let him immediately get three bases and immediately get all the structures up to be able to churn that army mixture out very, very quickly. I will say, though, massing up Phoenixes is awesome. 
I really like massing up Phoenix. Ever since I saw Xerax do a lot of that in the TSL qualifiers, I've just been very, very, very intrigued where, yeah, you get the expansion, you get the Colossus up, but you really gently start going for the Colossus and you just nonstop Phoenix it up all day. You can easily get a lot better map control in a situation like that. Um, but again, if you're against a Mondragon or an Idra, you can easily uh, fall to a lot of Ling Roach pressure with a lot of um, a lot of dropping action. So I, I would say that I think it's reasonable for him to continue to go Phoenixes and that you would just need to test it. So let's see here. Um, trying to find some questions about Idra because a lot of people are asking like why didn't White Raw win oh no oh man White Raw trying to think here mm. oh yeah hey here's a great question by Big by Big Smoke Big Smoke asks why Idra didn't go Mutalisks instead of Roaches. Now, uh, you heard me have a brief discussion in the middle of the daily about um, sidestepping. That a lot of times it's easy to think about the direct response to what you're seeing in front of you. Aha, he's making air. I will therefore build Hydralisks and win. I will kill off all his air with Hydralisks and dominate his forces. But then he builds Colossus, you're in trouble. Or I'm going to build a lot of Corruptors to deal with air, but then now your Corruptors can't really do much of anything. Or even if you build a lot of Spore Crawlers and Queens. And that the Roach was a way to sidestep that. The Mutalisks are also an interesting example because, yeah, the Mutalisks will allow you to pick off the Void Rays, and if you have enough, you can take out the Phoenixes. And then also you can kind of begin to put pressure back on the Protoss. The reason that I like the Roach play a little more than the Mutalisk play is one, time-wise, it's kind of difficult to get enough gas to get a lot of Mutalisks up early. But also, when you get the Mutalisks up, it's a very straightforward way for your opponent to defend. He begins churning out a lot of Phoenixes. He begins to... Um, um, he can easily bounce around and follow the Mutalisks. The Mutalisks don't actually operate very well when split up. However, the roaches operate really well when split up. Four roaches off doing their own thing. That's a cheap investment. That's 300 minerals and 100 gas. Awesome. Go kill his main. You know, but if you had five mules in his main and five mules at an expansion, that's like 500, 500 in each spot, doing about as much damage as the roaches would be doing. The only, I mean, there's other advantages the mutilists have, like that they can fly and shoot up and that, yeah, all that obvious goodness, but... What makes that Roach play good is specifically the timing, where a player who opened up with a lot of Stargates often doesn't quite have the ability to get back on his feet and defend a lot of locations at once. We're going to take one more question. Question. Do, 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 do. Um, doom, 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 doom. Uh, uh, oh, my chat is scrolling too quickly, too quickly. Oh, here's another, there's a great question from Pansy Dance, who has such a great name as well. Pansy Dance asks, Dear Day 9, why didn't Idris throw some banelings in the drops on minerals to kill workers? So one thing I want to throw out right now, uh, I don't know how many people are aware of this, of this little factoid that I'm about to lay on you. Um, banelings kill probes in with one baneling if you have a plus two melee upgrade, right? Plus two melee means your banelings will kill those probes in one explosion. And if you have plus three, you can even kill SCVs too. But in Zerker's Protoss, all it takes is a plus two upgrade. Which is why generally you'll see players really get those upgrades fast when they're going Ling Baneling. So in this circumstance, sure, banelings could have potentially been helpful. They definitely could have killed off some extra workers. Um, but there's two reasons I want to steer away from that whole Baneling play. One is that it's kind of hard to get Banelings in there based on what we've been doing. We're, we're already getting a Roach upgrade. We're already getting that missile attack. We already have a Roach Warren down. We've uh, started to make Roaches and Hydras to help us stay alive. Why veer away and get these Banelings? Um, 
economically, completely ignoring any strategy at all, economically, we've, we haven't really invested in them yet, and we're gonna have to start investing in them, and it's gonna be a time commitment, and in general, I want I always want your instinct not to be, what else can I add to this strategy? I want it to be, what more can I pull out? Because the fewer things that you have in your play, what you'll be left with is this amazingly strong force. The more variety of units you get, the overall weaker your army gets. If, um, if you just stick with one unit, you'll have a really big army. It might have vulnerabilities, but it will definitely be large. So you want to have as few things in that mix as possible. So that's the first reason. I want to try to trim the fat off my builds as much as I can. And it seems like the Banelings, though good, seems like a little bit of fat. The second reason I want to not get Banelings here is just that I don't think that the Banelings are doing anything that our Roach Drops aren't. That's another concept uh, that I call redundancy, which is where you end up double doing something. It's like if you have, um, um, it's like if you have a lot of ghosts to EMP and you have a lot of ravens to detect. You're kind of double doing the detection. There's no reason to get those twice. Or a lot of times you'll see players block their ramp with roaches and build spine crawlers at the front. It's, no, you're double defending that. I do feel like the Banelings would kind of be like a double attack on the workers. Like, I'm going to drop roaches and kill your workers, and hydras and kill your workers, and then I'll drop Banelings to kill your workers. Workers are dying. I don't think that there's ever really been the issue there. Um, you might say, I, I do think it's reasonable, though, to say something like, um, um, later on in the game, when you have the resources to add a little more fat, if he is getting a huge army and somehow you could transition to Banelings effectively to get the Banelings to say, do big blanket drops, uh, on his army, uh, something like that. But even then I probably wouldn't do that because as we've seen, Idra already has a clear path pointing towards like corruptors and brood lords to be able to deal with that big ball. So that is going to wrap up the daily. Tomorrow's fun day, Monday, Tuesday is newbie Tuesday. Wednesday is uh, the day where I'm I'm gonna go um, out and get some sushi with my buddy, and then Thursday, I'll be at MLG. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be awesome. Until then, thank you for coming to join the day nine daily. I'd like to give you something. It's for you. You have a good day. I'm gonna go to bed because I'm on Korea time. Korea time for day nine, for day nine, he's in Korea time.